Hello, everyone. My name is Eva Gasperovich, and I'm a developer programs engineer here at Google. And this is Jeff Posnik. Hi, everybody. I'm also on the developer relations team at Google. Jeff is one of the uh, creators and main contributors to the Workbox library. Today, we are going to share with you our story about transforming the womentechmakers.com website into a progressive website. But before I get to it, let me tell you what brought the two of us together on that project. Some time ago, I was talking with a friend of mine, Megan, at work. And I knew she was involved with the Women Tech Makers program. So I asked her, how was it going? And she told me with a lot of enthusiasm in her voice, Eva, it's going great. The program is growing. And it's amazing because it's so community-based. There is so much going on. But actually, sometimes it's also challenging. It's hard to keep everyone in the loop. Given that everyone is going mobile these days, we're thinking whether we should have an app for it. And it made me think, if an app was the way to go, how about a progressive web app? It also made me personally curious. I knew quite well by then how to write a progressive web app from scratch. But transforming an existing life site is an entirely different story. And I know some of you are bothered about it as well, because you approached me during this conference already and asked about it. So I'm very happy that I'll be able today to share this story with you. <coughs> Luckily for me, this is also where Jeff comes into the picture. Around that time, he was working on a, a workbox library. When he learned about my migration plans, he approached me. And he said, listen, Eva, me and my team are working on a set of tools that would make your migration a bliss. Would you like to use it? And of course, I said yes. And that's how me and women tech makers became a guinea pig for the Workbox project. So that's what we settled on. We settled that women tech makers will get a progressive web app, that Jeff will provide us with tools, and I will get my discovery process about how it feels to migrate a website that I can share with all of you today. And this is exactly what we're going to do today. Our intention is to give you some insight and some tooling so that you can attempt migrations in your own projects in future with confidence. OK, let's start. First, I would like us to look into the decision process behind how we decided to go for a progressive web app. But in order for you to understand our decisions, you need to know more about women tech makers. Women Tech Makers is a Google Global program for women in technology. It is actually a great pleasure to talk about it here at I.O., because this is where all of this started. Six years ago, here at I.O., the first Women Tech Maker event took place. It was an event to bring support and community to women, to women who attended the conference. And I'm very happy to say that this support yielded the results and our number grew. In the old times, around 2013, there were only 8% women attending the conference. And this year, we aim to have 25% of us attending. And I'm happy to say that we made it. Since then, the Women Tech Maker have grown from a humble once per year event to now hosting hundreds of events for over 70,000 women worldwide. There is Women Tech Makers Scholars Program for college students, a membership to help women get the career support they need, and many more initiatives. It is now part of the global movement for women in technology. It's not focused in Silicon Valley only or even US only. It supports women in 160 countries. That's a lot of diverse environments. Because of that, women tech makers had to get creative at how they can support such growth at scale. When Women Tech Makers was entering new markets, it also started targeting new audiences. And these new audiences often meant more users on mobile devices and on less reliable internet connections. The program leaders wanted to make sure they have the infrastructure that supports this diverse environment. And it seemed that 
A progressive web app might be just what they need. A progressive web app is a web application that uses modern network capabilities to deliver app-like experience to the users. It should be, in particular, reliable, which means it should load instantly, even in uncertain network conditions. It should be fast, which means it should react to user ac users' actions on all kinds of devices. And it should be engaging, which means it should feel like a natural app on the device, providing an immersive user experience. You can see how those features corresponded with the Women Tech Makers goals. By making the site reliable and fast, we would improve experience for users on mobile and on slow internet connections. And by making the app always just one click away for the user on their mobile phones, uh, it would help to keep users engaged and involved even more in the community. It would allow us to improve user experience and stay frugal at the same time. We could keep current infrastructure, have a single code base, and support only one platform going forward. So that was the decision. We will migrate this site to a progressive web app. So how did we do it? How did we approach our migration? Well, this is the process we roughly followed. First of all, we needed to understand deep in detail the current state of our site. In order to do that, we use Lighthouse. How many of you know what Lighthouse is or use it? Yeah, you've been to the mobile web tent, hopefully. <coughs> OK, so Lighthouse is a Chrome extension that all of you can install in your browser that allows you to measure how close your web app is to a progressive web app. When you run your website through Lighthouse, it gives you back a report and a score that summarizes the state of the app for you. When we started the process, our score was about 45. And our goal was to get as close to 100 as possible without changing how the site looked or worked in general. That's why we called it migration. We didn't want to alter the site too much. We just wanted to make it smoother in different environments. If you're curious about your own site scores, you can try out the lighthouse in the web tent. And if it goes green, it means you have an amazing, amazing <laughs> website. So here's how our Lighthouse report looked like. You see the score there. But apart from that, you also see a list of features or traits that the website should have in order to be considered progressive. The green ones means we're doing well on those. And the red ones mean there is area for improvement. And one cool thing about this list is that actually each of those is an expandable section. So you can click on it and see uh, more uh, information about the particular feature and also find links that lead you to resources that tell you how to actually implement that feature or get better on it. And this makes it a super cool tool for people that are less experienced with progressive web apps. Because as a matter of fact, you don't even need to know what features you should implement in order to get progressive. Lighthouse will simply tell you. As you can see, our Lighthouse was 45, and we were presented with a list of options. So what do we do next? Well, we needed to prioritize. Because we didn't have all the resources in the world, and we didn't have all the time in the world, we needed to make sure we focus on the most important things first. And this is why I put a Women Tech Makers logo there, because that's the moment where you take the technology you have, like a Lighthouse report, and bring it back to organization or to business people. Because those are folks that know best what's good for the users. And important thing to remember about the progressive web app is that it's not a monolithic technology that you just drop on your site. It's actually a set of modular uh, solutions that you can usually implement independently on each other. So you can take that list and just pick and choose and decide what would make the biggest difference first, and then iterate on it. So you don't need to be scared that you need to do everything in one go. You can start with smaller changes and take it from there. In our case, we decided to focus on two areas, on offline and on app-like experience. Offline, obviously, would improve the performance on uh, low internet connections. And that would improve how the app works not only for the users 
in the countries where the connection is scarce, but also in environment like some big conferences. You've probably encountered this problem where you can't really access the uh, website during a conference. And Women Tech Maker is a lot of driven, uh, is even driven uh, initiative. So it was important to add that. Secondly, we decided to add ad app like experience, which means um, you can now install the app to home screen of your mobile device. Uh, we, we've hoped that this will drive engagement with the users over time, that it will be easier to keep everyone in the loop. Once we have our priorities, we needed to get to know our tools. In just a moment, Jeff will work you, will take you through all the ins and outs of the Workbox library, and he will show how easy with this library our migration became. Once Jeff is done, I will tell you a little bit about how we actually implemented uh, the whole process. I'm going to share some challenges we tackled during the, um, during the implementation phase and share some lessons learned. So I hope you will find that part really interesting. Finally, at the end of the process, it is important to measure what you achieved. Of course, first of all, we wanted to know our Lighthouse score, if it's 100. Uh, this is a measurement you do for yourself to know how well you did uh, on the migration, but it's also important for your stakeholders because it gives a nice, concise, and numerical way of presenting the progress you made on your app. While this number can bring a lot of satisfaction, especially if it turns green and it lights a lighthouse <laughs> out there, the second type of measurement I put out there, the Google Analytics, is even more important to me because I think it's very important to check afterwards how your users reacted to the changes you introduced. After all, it's the users that are the ultimate judge of your changes. And this also gives you a nice base to start this process again. Once more, progressive web app can be developed gradually and iteratively over time. So you can just start the whole process again, follow this path, and iterate as many times as needed to achieve the optimal user experience. Now, you know more about the business case we wanted to solve and about the process we followed. So how about we get a little bit more technical? Jeff, are you ready? Thanks, Eva. So uh, before we detail the specific tools that we used, I wanted to provide some background on a web platform technology called Service Workers. Service workers are code that you write in JavaScript, and they act kind of like a proxy server sitting in between your web app and the network. They could intercept network requests, and they could return a response from some cache that they choose uh, or from the network, or they could implement custom logic that mixes and matches where they get the response from. Now, with the right service worker in place, we could create a web app that loads in almost instantly and works even when you're offline. But if you're not familiar with service workers, it could be kind of hard to picture exactly what's going on. So an analogy might help. You can imagine that a service worker is like an air traffic controller. And think about your web app's requests and response as airplanes that are taking off and landing. So let's see how that analogy plays out when your web app makes an HTTP request. So all right, we have this airplane representing a request. It's taken off. Um, we're making a get request for this image. And now the service worker is in control. It gets to decide the route while your request is in flight. And for a URL that we've never seen before, it ends up just going against the network. You know, it'll re receive a response just like it normally does. That response will go back to your page. But the really cool thing is that the service worker could decide, hey, you know, I actually want to save a copy of that response for use later in a cache. And that's great. So our web app gets a response, and we have a cache copy that's good to go. So next time a request takes off, same URL that we saw before, the service worker is like, hey, you know, I know this URL. I could go straight to the cache. I could give the page a response from that cache, uh, bypass the network completely, and everything looks the same from the perspective of the page. 
So that's really cool, and that's really what the service worker is doing in a nutshell. It's um, routing where your requests will go and having some intelligent logic there. But you know, many people would be reluctant to write code for an air traffic control system from scratch, uh, and I don't blame you. Uh, but while the service worker API isn't quite as complex as that, there are some subtle issues that you could easily run into. And problematic service worker code can lead to things like delayed updates or missing content in your web app, just like buggy air traffic control code could lead to flight delays or even worse. So the Women Tech Makers Service Worker implementation uses a brand new set of tools that we're happy to announce today. And it's called Workbox. And you can find out all about it at workboxjs.org. Happy to see people taking pictures. I'll give you a chance for that. <laughs> um, so I'd like to walk you all through some of the common service worker use cases and show how Workbox helps you avoid subtle problems that you might bump into if you build everything from scratch. All right, so first up, uh, most service worker implementations start by adding all the critical assets that they need to a cache, making sure that they'll be available for later reuse. And this is referred to as pre-caching. So here's some basic service worker code that waits for a given version of a service worker to be installed, and then pre-caches a list of URLs. And this is the sort of thing you might just find in some sample on the internet and copy and paste and maybe even deploy right away. But there's some pitfalls that become apparent as you release newer versions of your web app or add in additional assets. So one thing is you need to remember to manually bump that version variable each time you change anything, or else the new assets might not get pre-cached. You also need to keep updating that array of URLs. Uh, that reflect your asset's current file names. And that's particularly tricky when your URLs contain version assets, like you see there, sorry, version passage, like you see there with uh, the JavaScript and the CSS files. And you know, if your site could be accessed via slash or via index.html, you need to have cache entries for both. Forgetting to do any of that could lead to a service worker that continues serving stale content or just doesn't have a fully populated cache. So instead of going it alone, you could sidestep those pitfalls by using Workbox. It integrates into your existing build process, whether you're using Webpack, NPM scripts, Gulp, or in the Women Tech Maker's case, Grunt. So let's take a quick look at how Workbox implements pre-caching. There's a single method, pre-cache, that takes in a list of files and all of their revision information. We call this information the pre-cache manifest. You can see our source service worker file here, which is just a pretty empty pre-cache manifest, not doing very much. Uh, the nice thing is, though, in this source file, we don't have to hard code a really hard to maintain list of URLs or anything like that. We could keep it empty. And the goal of the build process is to figure out what should go into that manifest. So our final service worker file will have that empty manifest replaced with a list of URLs along with versioning information about each URL. And Workbox ensures that all of your pre-cached files are available offline using the revision inf info in that manifest to keep them all up to date. All right, let's take a closer look at the build process that we're using to get that final service worker file. And we're, here we're using a method called inject manifest, which is part of the workbox build module. We pass in the source service worker file, and that's the one that has that empty manifest. And we tell it where to write the destination file, uh, and that will have the fully populated manifest ready for use. Nice thing is we could use wildcard patterns to tell workbox which files we want to be pre-cached. So whenever we add or rename one of our files, we don't have to remember to manually update the list of URLs. And there's also no longer a need to increment a version variable. Workbox handles versioning for us via the revision details in the manifest. We can also tell Workbox that our site responds to requests for the forward slash with the contents of index.html, so we don't end up having to pre-cache two separate entries. Okay. 
So that's only one part of the picture. Uh, in addition to pre-caching, it's really common to use runtime caching strategies for resources that are either used infrequently or just too large to pre-cache. You might, for instance, use runtime caching to handle requests for images that aren't needed for every section of your site. Here's some boilerplate code that implements a runtime caching strategy. It fetches a response from the network, but first it saves a copy of the response in the cache. It's the sort of thing, again, you might copy and paste from a sample on the internet. And it's very similar to what we saw illustrated earlier in that air traffic controller example. But the subtlety here is that while your code will add entries to the cache, there's actually no code that's going to clean up those entries when they're no longer needed. So think back to those airplanes delivering the image files to the cache. So they're going to keep landing in the cache with more and more images. And our air traffic controller isn't going to do anything to stop them from piling up. In practice, this is the sort of code that will lead to cache responses that build up over time, which waste storage space in your users' devices. And you know, that's only one half of the picture, though, with runtime caching. Once you defined your caching strategy, you need to tell your service worker when to use that strategy. That's called routing. And here's some boilerplate code that checks whether it's a request for a URL ending in PNG. And if so, uses that runtime caching strategy that we just described. And for a very ba basic web app, that might be fine. But things get out of hand pretty quickly if you need to implement different runtime caching strategies for different type of resources. You end up chaining them all together in a big if-else block. And that just really doesn't scale very well. All right, so let's see how, the women how we're using Workbox on the Women Tech Makers site to handle runtime caching. So there's a number of features that lead to clearer, more concise runtime caching code, as you can see there. First, we have a built-in router. And this takes care of responding to requests when a certain criteria are met. And here, we're using a regular expression as the criteria for what triggers our routes. Workbox has built-in support for common caching strategies, so we don't have to write or more likely copy our own response logic. They're ready to use right out of the box. But Workbox goes beyond the basics, allowing us to customize the built-in strategies with powerful options, like specifying an expiration policy for a given cache. Workbox will take care of cleaning up old entries automatically instead of them being saved indefinitely on your user's devices. So going back to our airplane analogy, our air traffic controller knows how to clear out the previous planes to make room for new ones. And so let's just take a look at the impact of adding Workbox to the site. So as you can see in the screenshot in the DevTools network panel, even if a user's device is completely offline, all the responses we need come from the service worker, giving us a progressive web app that loads in under a second. You no longer have to build a native app to get this kind of speed, reliability, and network independence. So that's great, but we don't have to stop there. Workbox also offers a number of built-in features that go beyond caching. And I'd like to highlight a couple of them that the Women Tech Makers site is using. You know, first, Workbox makes it easy to add in support for offline Google Analytics. All it takes to turn it on is a single line of code. Once enabled, Google Analytics requests that are made when the network is unavailable will be automatically queued up on your user's devices and then replayed when the network comes back. This means that the Women Tech Makers team won't lose out on valuable insights when users access their PWA while they're offline. Work, Workbox also helps you follow user experience best practices. So using a cache-first strategy means that your PWA could load almost instantly. But it also means that your users will see previously cached content on their next visit, even if you've deployed an update to your site. So a really common UX pattern to follow is displaying a little toast message, like you see at the bottom of the screen there, letting your users know that if they refresh the page, they'll see the latest content. And Workbox makes it easy to follow this UX pattern 
by broadcasting a message to your page when there's an update made to one of the caches that it maintains. And this message includes important context, like the URL of the resource that was updated. And this gives you the flexibility of ignoring updates of less important assets, like some random CSS file, while prompting the user to refresh when something critical is updated, like the site's main HTML. So that's just a small overview of what Workbox can do. We hope that you find Workbox equally useful when you're building your own progressive web apps. It's available for use today. We're 1.0. And examples can be found at workboxjs.org. I really want to offer a special thanks to Eva and the Women Tech Makers team for being an early adopter of the library and for offering tons of valuable feedback along the way. So thank you for that. All right, back to implementation. But first of all, thank you, Jeff, for walking us through the library. And thanks for implementing it in the first place. It saved me a ton of time. I actually think it made me delete more code than I added in the first place. OK, implementation. The first takeaway I wanted to share with you from the implementation process is that going for a progressive web app is a great audit opportunity. And not only because Lighthouse will list all of your performance scenes anyways, but because when you're planning to implement offline, especially it in, if it involves caching some part of the website on user's device, you really need to be respectful of user's resources, like bandwidth or storage space. And you don't want to push to user's cache a bloated website, unnecessary assets, because it's a waste. Making the site lean and resource friendly should be a priority. And it makes it more usable to all users, not only the ones using the offline mode. And often, it's really not very hard. Uh, usually, you can find some easy fixes and pick the low-hanging fruit to start with. That's what we did with Women Tech Makers. Let's look at the example. This is the network panel for Women Tech Makers site. What I did here, I just sorted all the assets the, page, the old page was using by size. And only by looking at the very top of that list you can easily spot easy targets for optimization. The bigger the file, the higher chance you can optimize. Here you can see the two biggest files by far are the base.js, which was part of the uh, YouTube API uh, JavaScript file, and the header, which is this nice big hero image um, on the home page. So can we optimize those? Let's start with the image. It covers the full header area of the page. So it should be as big as the viewport, at least. But it doesn't need to be bigger than that. So if the viewport is smaller, you can make the image smaller. What I did here, I just created two more versions of that image, a medium-sized one and a small one. I added a few breakpoints in my CSS so that it uses the appropriate image for the appropriate viewport. And look at the stats. It allowed me to save 21% on overall image load on that page with how many nine lines of code, if you count brackets, right? So imagine this was the gain just from one image. Imagine what would happen if you do it for more of your images on the page. It's a really easy fix. Now YouTube API. Over the lifespan of your page, you know, the libraries and the resources you're using might change. The new ones come up, some become obsolete, and so on. In this case, everything that we were achieving through the YouTube API now is possible to do with an iframe when it's configured properly. So by embedding YouTube videos on the page with iframe instead of YouTube API, we could just delete that file. And suddenly we gained you know, 400 kilobytes of uh, the overall page weight. And if we didn't make this decision to go for, for a progressive web app, probably we wouldn't even spot that there is this opportunity. So it's a good moment when you go for a progressive web app to stop and, and think again about resources you're using. Similar thing, the Lodash library. Uh, we were using only some basic functionality of the library, so we were able to replace Lodash with Lodash core. And this brought us from 24 kilobytes to 4 kilobytes. You might say that 20 kilobytes is not that big, 
but this really adds up uh, in your whole page. And again, here I change only five characters in my old code, and that's the gain, right? So it's really easy uh, to, to get that. Now, once we ensure that we're not pushing too big resources to the user, it would be good to also make sure we don't push things twice if we don't need to. For that, we need to leverage browser caching. And this is different caching from service worker caching. It's just regular browser cache. Every browser has it these days. So in the old site, what was happening, with every build of the site, we would version files, or cache bust, if you will, by the version, num like build number, or by timestamp, timestamp in some cases. And this is kind of uncool, because every time we made a new build of the site, the file would get a new name, even though the file itself might not have changed. That would prevent the browser from caching it, because the browser doesn't know that under different name, it's still the same content. So instead, we switch to content-based hashing, as you see in the lower example. Now, we make a hash of the content, and we embed it in the file name, which means the file will get a new address only if the actual contents change. So this allowed us to push less resources to the users. And remember, we Tech Makers is a community. A lot of people are coming over and over to the page over the lifespan of their contacts with women tech makers. OK. So a lot of this type of gains are really findable in your Lighthouse report. If you dig deep, you will find a lot of good practices and good hints embedded in that report. So just by following you know, the red color, uh, you can find a lot of optimizations that would make decide better for all of your users. Now, the second takeaway, and it's going to be quite a journey, so bear with me on that one, is about rethinking your site resources, but not from like performance perspective. Let's say your site is nice and clean, and it's time to think what to cache and when so that users can use your site offline. We call it a caching strategy. And for Coming up with the right caching strategy, you really need to understand your site resources, like images, media, and content. Let's look at the example. This is the Women Tech Makers site as loaded online. It's a rich visual experience. Lots of images, lots of graphical you know, effects. It's really a beautiful site. What would happen if we saved all of the images from all of this site to users' cache? it will just become really crowded. Imagine the user wants to you know, browse a lot of websites on, on their device. If each of the websites downloaded all possible images from the whole app, that would make it really inefficient. So the question is, are they really necessary, the images? Maybe they're not at the core of the site. Well, that's how it looks like without images. <laughs> it's kind of ugly. But apart from being ugly, the site is also unusable. Like, you can't even click to go to different page, which means it's entirely broken. This means no images is a no-go. And all images is a no-go. You need to find a middle ground somewhere. So how do you find a middle ground? Well, I started to think about images by the function they have on the website. Let's go color by color. The yellow ones are images that are for navigation and the images that allow user to perform some action. And this means they're super important. If they're not there, the user cannot really use the website. They cannot perform the action. They have absolute priority. Now, the red ones are the ones, in our case, they were related to branding. But in your case, it might be different. Those are images that you, for some reason, put priority on. These might be images, for example, that create the connection between your app and the user. Like, for example, something that allows your user to understand what type of app they're using, right? So these are your priority images. To the contrary, the blue ones are purely decorative. They're cool. They make the website look nice. But if they're missing, it's not the end of the world. Now, the green ones are kind of funky because I call them informative images. What I mean by this is that apart from you know, adding to the visual side of the story, they also convey some message. In this case, they tell you which of the companies um, 
featured content, right? So I call them informative because apart from being visual, they also convey a message. Now, what would happen if we apply different caching strategy to different type of image? The inline ones, uh, the navigation and action ones are super important. So what I did, I just inlined them. Because they're small, they're icons, I just encoded them in SVG, and I put them directly in my HTML. This means I don't even need to think about caching strategy, because if HTML is there, the images are there, and I'm done. Easy fix. Now, branding and priority, I pre-cache. And you saw that with Workbox, pre-caching is pretty straightforward. Those are images that I always put in user's cache, because they're really important for my user's experience with the app. The blue ones, I cache at runtime. This means that when user enters the particular part of the site, I cache them on a kind of best effort basis. So there is no guarantee there will be in the cache when uh, the user re-enters that site on, in offline mode. I also put a limit so that there aren't, they don't build up forever, right? Um, and this means that they might be in the cache and serve their purpose, or they might be missing. What happens if they're missing? Well, the site is slightly less visually attractive, but it's not the end of the world, right? Like, the site is still usable. The content is there. You can check your events, and so on. Now, informative images are super cool because they show you the full power of service worker. What I wanted to do here, when the image is not in the cache, I wanted to serve some kind of a placeholder, you know, that tells you there, well, there was supposed to be an image, but it's unavailable. But I also wanted to can convey the message. So I was using the alt tag of the images to read like what comp company it referred to and try to render this image in Service Worker. And that's the cool thing, that Service Worker is just a JavaScript file. So you can do all kind of crazy rendering in there. Like here, I'm creating an SVG with the kind of offline icon. And I attach the name of the company so that I don't really store anything. Those images were never in my cache. I just rendered them on the fly, and they still serve the purpose of the website. So those are the four caching strategies um, I used uh, with the help of the Workbox library on Women TechMaker. And the truth is, your sites, your projects might be different. And you might need different caching strategies. But it should show you the direction you should go for. Um, with the flexibility of Service Worker, you can find a strategy that would be best suited for your users' needs. Now, let's say we implemented all this offline and progressiveness on our app. What I wanted to tell you from my experience with this um, migration is that these things really influence other parts of your app as well. And you need to remember about that, because if you forget, then um, you'll get in trouble in the other parts of your app. Remember the little toast message that Jeff showed you when the, there was a new version of the app? This is the type of influence on the UX I have in mind. You really need to think how going offline influences your user's UX and respond accordingly. For example, there might be a form on your site that you actually cannot submit where you're in offline mode. So you need to remember now that, OK, it's not enough to dump everything in the ca user's cache. I also need to. Remember to implement something to tell user, oh, sorry, you can't do this while in offline mode. The second thing is to measure your impact. Some of the interaction with the user will now happen in the offline mode, so you need to add offline analytics tracking. And you saw in the workbox that it's just one line of code, but it's your task to remember to put that line in your service worker and not forget about it. Finally. Developing offline first can change your developer workflow. And here are some hints that I found useful during development. First of all, it is useful to have two different service workers for different environments. We separated our development service worker from the production service worker, because in development, we didn't want anything cached, right? Like you want to be able to refresh your page and see your changes. So we just had an empty service worker, like an empty file. Because Service Worker is a progressive enhancement, it doesn't harm that it doesn't do anything. It's just transparent for all the requests, right? And then in production, we had a fully fledged you know, Service Worker that does all the caching. 
So that's the solution we used for separating environments. Now, when you're developing offline and you're actually working with the service worker, you often want to see how your page would look like for a user that enters the site first time. And if you keep refreshing, that's not that easily achievable. So for that, the best solution is to use the incognito mode. Also, when you do some mistakes and you really mess up all your caches and you don't know what's happening again, just go incognito, start from scratch, keep calm, and go incognito. <laughs> incognito is your friend. <laughs> and finally, I just wanted to reiterate that you should really um, use build tools to version your files. Trying to do it by hand is just asking for trouble. And because the uh, Workbox build process is just an NPM module, you can usually integrate it with whatever workflow you have there. So really do use tools in order to avoid you know, manual fiddling with the cache entries. What happens if there is no service worker uh, at the user's browser? Well, the cool thing is there is no problem. All of the stuff we discussed here is progressive enhancement, which means users that do have service worker available will get some more features, some more um, robust behaviors like offline experience. But even the users that don't have it will get a lot of gain from your progressive web app because of all those other fixes you did on the way, because of the better normal caching, better uh, performance, uh, linear website, and so on. So I really encourage you to consider progressive web app for your web projects, because in the end, it will um, increase satisfaction for all of your user base. Did we implement everything we wanted? Well, no. There's always more. And there are improvements that did not make the bar. Here is an example of a few of those that we plan to implement in future. But as I told you, this process can go and go on and go on and go on. And as long as Natalie, the boss of the Women Take America, allow us to work on it, maybe we'll get them implemented with the next iteration. All right. So let's recap a bit. I told you today a little bit about Women Tech Makers. I told you about the migration we attempted. I told you how the process looked, uh, looked like for us so that you know where to start on your own. Jeff walked you through the tools, the workbox library, and we shared some lessons learned around Perf, about resources prioritization, and about the development workflow. I hope you enjoyed that. Now it's your turn. Go and start your own uh, progressive migrations. Yeah. So what's next? Where are some good places to go? Uh, we put together a lot of really great PWA guidance on developers.google.com. We hope you check that out. Uh, hopefully, everybody's inspired to use Lighthouse either in person in the sandbox, or you could just go and get the extension for yourself. Um, you can get that. You can find out more about that at developers.google.com as well. And I hope that folks try Workbox. Give us feedback. Um, we're really looking to talk to more developers about it as well. So you can find us in the sandbox and like the libraries and frameworks section. Some of us who worked on it are here as well. It wasn't just me. And workboxjs.org is the site for that. Yeah, and remember to join the Women Tech Makers movement. And remember that all genders are welcome in the movement. So join us. Hey. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks a lot.